Red Sox, who we've already heard a little bit about. Uh, Mike Goodwin told about his adventures. And when uh, Banner came and visited Les in the hospital, um, Les took notes of their conversation on, I think, the sporting page. And he was, he was adamant that we didn't recycle that sporting page. So, I think Banner is still here. And he's here to talk to us. Daddy uh, brought us to get together. Tom was the one who would bring so many people together, introducing me to Les, uh, showing me some of his films. And it dawned immediately on me that this was big. It was something very important, that there was someone out uh, a little bit, uh, I had the feeling like the photographer Curtis, who in the early part of the 20th century documented the vanishing Native Indian tribes. And I had the feeling there was someone out there who documented uh, uh, some part of American life, margins uh, of American life that nobody else documented and we have <coughs> access to that because of less. No one else did that. And Tom was kind enough to warn me, telling me it might be not easy to have a conversation with him because he's it was kind of monosyllabic. I found out. I found out that quite often he was zero syllabic. <laughs> we, got, we got along very well, and I immediately had the feeling uh, that less, and I maintain that uh, for the future, he is a national treasure. Uh, and in our first conversations with uh, Les, I do remember that I told him being born by Tom Luddy, I told him about me being from Bavaria and we had these peasants in the country who would sit and brood behind the stein of beer <laughs> for, for, for half an hour, full hour, look each other in the eye and I would know there would be a fight. And, and I would know that one of them finally would say, you won't dare that one. And the other one would say, yes, I will. And then they would stare at each other again for a while and all of a sudden, quietly, the guy uh, raises his beer mug and hits it over the head of his opponent. <laughs> but he couldn't predict it. There was a timing of that. And um, I always kept wondering about uh, the sense of timing of Les Blank in his, in his films. And when he showed up at the uh, set, uh, of uh, Fitzcarraldo, I had the feeling there was something not completely right because uh, he uh, would be hanging around all day having a beer after the other and I would tell him less uh, uh, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, we have a real event, it's the first time we are going to move the ship which we couldn't move for months. Uh, which had to go over a mountain and he wouldn't show up he, uh, and he said I'm not here for filming events you know what I filmed this morning I filmed an ant that carries a feather of a, of a parrot and that was a huge event for him and I, I really admired him for, for that and of course sometimes what you heard before uh, of course in Burden of Dreams there is a rant uh, from me uh, about Mother Nature, which I can't stand the term Mother Nature. I keep cringing when I just hear that. Uh, and and that was, uh, uh, I heard it in particular from the few Americans that we had on the set. Uh, and you have to know, we had two plane crashes. We had uh, run into a border war between Peru and Ecuador and the camp that I had built for 1,100 people was attacked and burned to the ground. We had uh, uh, the main actor lost out of the film due to illness. On and on and on and on and on. And the Americans would say, ah yeah, look at the beautiful skies and the harmony and the spheres. And I just snap back, no, this is a mess up there. And of course, and of course Les, Les would notice this kind of, of, of brief moments of ranting and, and in a way he waited, he, he heard it for at least two weeks or so 
me addressing the universe and addressing Mother Nature. And uh, Kinski kept screaming at me how erotic the jungle was. I said, to, and, and he would fornicate with a tree just to make a point how erotic <laughs> Mother Nature was. And I said, I said to him, Klaus, uh, nature is not erotic, it's just obscene. The jungle is obscene. And, and less, less uh, overheard some of that. And in a way, it was triggered. He, he knew the moment was right. Uh, and of course, uh, he was told uh, also that um, I had made some, some kind of wild remarks. And he comes at the right moment and does it. And, and I was standing in the jungle and there was a vine protruding and somehow uh, bobbing up and down somehow slightly. And he said, move a little bit over there, move to the vine. And I understood, yes, he means business now. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, Strangely enough, uh, he looked unfocused, but he was not really unfocused. And I noticed that uh, early on when we were in Iquitos, in our headquarters where we organized things, and there were sometimes a week or ten days, a fortnight of, of inaction, and we would play a game, it's called Zappo, it's a table with holes in it uh, of different value, and you toss a very thick big large coin and you try to accumulate points but in the middle of this table was a, a bronze frog the sapo and the sapo had his his mouth open not very wide and to hit into the mouth of the sapo was was the, was a million points or so and, and it took uh, it took an enormous effort i tried it for months and i managed once to hit the mouth of the sapo and Les was, was at it, I mean, he was really focused and he wouldn't give up and I saw him days on end uh, doing this and uh, hitting the mouth of the Zappo is almost an equivalent of even like in golf, hole in one. And he came and he said to me, Werner, come over, uh, I'll show you something. And he hits two consecutive hole in ones and I thought, man, yeah, he, this man is focused. He means business. And um, I started to really enjoy the, his uncanny instinct and knowledge of the right moment. This is something you cannot learn in film school. You can only learn it by knowing the heart of men. And he somehow had that. And it's, it's something very, very mysterious. And I tried to, to understand it and I tried to in a way not imitate it, but uh, in a way to activate it for, for my own work. And um, um, it, it doesn't function like, like with less. There are magnificent moments, uh, for example, um, mysterious magnificent moments I recall just, uh, for example, Clifton Chenier and uh, I think the grandchildren are trying, grown up grandchildren trying to make the grandmother speak, who is, I think, 106 years old, completely a, a complete gone. The grandmother, uh, not really speaking anymore, and completely into Alzheimer's. In the way that the beauty, how they try to make her say something, is, is just unbelievable. How does he catch a moment like this? This is very mysterious. It absolutely intense, and uh, God knows where he had it, and how he how he had it. How he did that, or moments in Spend It All, um, wonderful film. The beginning of the film is for me the best beginning of a film that I've ever seen. And um, we, we would talk about this very, very uh, briefly about these moments, and, and he couldn't, he didn't have a real answer for that. And he said, uh, well, I know how to do it, and sometimes he would sit all day long behind a beer, and then when the light was almost gone, he would quietly pick up the camera and shoot something, and it was essential. And capturing the essence of life, capturing something that is deeply humanistic, that was his quality, and I, I always admired him for that. And I do remember a moment in the film <coughs> Um, about Mans Lipscomb, uh, what is the title of it, Tom, you have to... 
a well-spent life. So, yes, a well-spent life. I, I do believe it's in this film a magnificent moment. Uh, I think towards uh, at the end of the film, man's lips come with uh, by the river, and you can really understand immediately. Uh, Les picked up the camera when it was barely or almost too late, when there was barely any life, uh, any light anymore. The river is flowing slowly and man's standing there musing about life and uh, the sun is down and he quietly after a long pause it quietly turns towards the camera and says quietly there are no other men's like me. <laughs> and it's just, uh, just an incredible moment. And um, when I think about Les, I have exactly the same feeling as if he was turning towards us and, and just saying that one line, there are no men like me. Mm. And that was Les Blank for me. Thank you. Thank you.